good. The producers behind the scenes at Score North and 1500 ESPN have sports opinions. So they want you to hear them. It's the perfect digital sports soapbox to scratch that Minnesota sports itch. This is the Score North Taxi Squad. Who might want J.J. McCarthy more than the Minnesota Vikings? No! Buddy, Well, maybe the Washington Commanders, but we'll get to that in just a second. Welcome into the Score North Taxi Squad, everyone. My name is Jason Stormer. Joined along, Artis Woods. No A.J. Fredersen today. No Grant Wengstern today. So me and Artis are driving this this taxi, I guess, uh, on this Wednesday evening going into a Thursday morning. Artis, how you doing? A lot of stuff to talk about with Minnesota sports. Once again, the Vikings just keep the news cycle going. But otherwise, how are we feeling on this Wednesday where you get to watch a Wolves game simultaneously as we record? this podcast as well that's pretty nice yeah feeling good man uh the wolves are um looks like they're already starting to slightly pull away from the pistons i think this should be an easy win don't want to overlook mm-hmm. anybody but it's the pistons the pistons are not a great team so this should be a pretty easy win for uh the wolves but feeling feeling really good obviously gonna get into some vikings talk as well some draft talk this McCarthy stuff is picking up in ways it's I just, never thought it would. The train um, is sure we has left the station, and I don't think it's stopping, man. It's yeah. insane, the hype so, for this guy. Definitely, definitely we'll yeah. get into that. Him him possibly going too is, yeah, we'll get into it. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into it. whole lot of other stuff going on too, obviously, the Timberwolves, the Minnesota Wild. I'm wearing a lot of Minnesota Twins garb, as you can see. Uh, opening day is literally right around the corner. It's starting tomorrow for the Minnesota Twins and all of Major League Baseball, so I'll have a little bit to talk about maybe towards the end of the show, but obviously we got to focus on the teams that are front and center right now, artists, and obviously, even though it's the offseason, that is the Minnesota Vikings, just with all the reckless speculation going on about what we are going to do at the quarterback position now that Kirk Cousins is gone. We've talked about it a ton about potential draft prospects for the Vikings over the last couple of weeks. Obviously, Sam Darnold, the bridge quarterback. But I think more so than any week, Artis, uh, we have probably the most direction right now in a sense of where the Vikings might actually go. Because per Matt Miller of ESPN, he basically said this past week that the Minnesota Vikings are, quote, expected to be very aggressive in trading up. Trading up, mind you, is the keyword in that phrase uh, for J.J. McCarthy. Obviously, this comes off the heels of the Vikings attending his pro day, doing private workouts and uh, consultations with him and everything. This is not necessarily unexpected artists, but still the fact that we actually have some maybe written confirmation from some pretty legitimate sources that the Vikings might actually do potentially whatever it takes to get J.J. McCarthy is pretty wild. Maybe artists, it looks like the Vikings have identified their guy. What do you think? Yeah, uh, like I said, it's no secret I'm not the biggest fan of J.J. McCarthy, but if they like it, I love it. Um, I'm of the proponent that I trust KLC. I love him as an offensive play caller. I love him as a head coach. Um, I trust Quasey. I know a lot of people may feel differently about that, may feel differently about his draft picks and all of that, but I trust him, honestly. Um, I trust what the resume he's put together so far as far, to, as, far as building a team, um, as far as putting a contender out there when healthy, you know. And so – If that's your guy, that's your guy. You know, they are right there front and center in ways that we just aren't, Jason. We aren't there in, you know, the building, checking out these players, going to the pro days, looking at all of the tape and all of the footage. We have the numbers and we have some tape, but not everything, right? And so if that's your guy, that's your guy. Um, I do find it interesting, and I I believe I said this last week and I'll say it again. I always find it very weird when players are, you know, scouted to be uh, or mocked to be, okay, they're a first-round draft pick or they're a second-round draft pick. You know, early in the offseason, I was hearing that McCarthy might be a second-round guy. And then out of nowhere, all right, now he's a first-round mm-hmm. guy. Okay, fair. He's a top 30, 32 guy. Fair. Then it's he might be a top 15 guy. Okay. <laughs> then it's he's a top 10 guy. Interesting. Then it's he might go number two, like really. <laughs> so that, that's for, to me, that's always a red flag because that never, in my opinion, it, it rarely pans out that a player flashes that much before the draft and pans out and turns out to be, in this case, the second best quarterback in the draft. But again, if the Vikings are a part of that high train, then I got to roll with it. I got to trust it. So, you know, my biggest thing, again, is finding your guy I've been big on that figure out who your guy is and once you figure out who your guy is if that's what you're gonna roll with figure out a way to do it and and do everything that's necessary to make sure you get your guy um I wouldn't give up a just every asset you have to get up to potentially two which is where he might go if he goes at two try to get to three get Jaden Daniels that's how I see it 
I think I'd rather have Jaden Daniels I'd than Jaden McCarthy I, personally. I'd but I mean, too. I don't know. That's how I see it. I think yeah. if he slips to three and you can find your way into that third draft spot, I think that's an easy run the card in. Here you go. Um, so that's how I look at it. Look at it. I look at it as a win-win. Honestly, in the case of the Vikings, if you can get up to three, and if Jaden can fall to, you know, maybe even if he doesn't go at three, maybe he falls to five, and you could trade up to five. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Who knows? But uh, I look at it as a win-win situation for the Timberwolves. So or Timberwolves, the Vikings. <laughs> um, so long as they 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 get one of those two guys, I would say. Yeah, I'm. I mean, we got to get a quarterback in this draft, no matter what. And so I don't want to put ourselves in a position where we're going to reach for that. So if if the demand really just becomes that crazy for JJ McCarthy on draft day, and we, we've talked about this, where I don't think you, me, AJ, or anybody else that we've had on the show is in the camp of wanting to give up three first round picks for a rookie quarterback potentially, even though that's probably that's probably the going rate if you want to get into the top three to get a guy like J- uh, Jaden Daniels or Drake May or whoever. Um, yeah, I agree with you, Artis. If if the Vikings identified the, as JJ McCarthy as their guy, then do what you can to get him, but also just be reasonable. And, you know, the, again, this does depend on who might be else, who might be available for them in the draft. And if they like those guys, if they like Michael Penix, if they like Bo Nix, um, didn't AJ say that Bo Nix, that the, nobody on the Minnesota Vikings attended Bo Nix's pro day or something like that? Yeah. So that might be a smokescreen, though. That might be the ultimate smokescreen by the Vikings. Let's show we're not interested. And actually, we really are, right? I don't know. I mean, there's there's smoke screens all over the place. But I really don't think the J.J. McCarthy stuff is a smokescreen at all. Uh, Dar- uh, Daniel Jeremiah with NFL Network has uh, said it himself that he's getting just quotes from a ton of sources all around the league that the J.J. McCarthy hype is real, that the demand is there from all these NFL teams. Teams and that a team might be able to or might be willing to pay a king's ransom to move up to get him because I mean as it is standing right now, artists I mean it's likely the first four picks in the draft are going to be quarterbacks, which is absolutely wild. I don't know if that's necessarily the right thing for these teams to do because probably one of those guys is going to end up a bust. But I mean again, these scouts, these trainers, these coaches, the they get to they get to observe these players in ways that we do. So there might actually be a chance that all four of these guys are actually studs. But let's get back to what we talked about with the Washington Commanders and the fact that they actually ha- there have been reports this week that they could actually take JJ McCarthy at number two. That was from Tom Pelissero, another very credible source working in the NFL. Um, if that's the case, artist, that would stun me just because that's not really been something discussed before. But again, if the hype is so real with J.J. McCarthy, if there's no stopping this train, I could see Washington doing something like this. Um, Washington has been known to kind of make boneheaded moves in their front office anyway. However, that is a whole new regime. Uh, Dan Snyder is gone. Magic Johnson's in. I think it's Magic Johnson isn't like a minority owner of Washington now or something like that. (laughs) So it's a completely, completely, completely different environment and that is not to say that a quarterback can't go to Washington and thrive but again it's just it's surprising it would not be a good decision it wouldn't to draft McCarthy <laughs> you say not. okay and they should have in my opinion um if they couldn't get their hands on Caleb Williams or if they don't want to draft Daniels I would have just held on to Sam Howell I thought Sam Howell hmm. showed promise last season but your offensive line could not protect them whatsoever he also had an issue, you know, patting the ball a little bit too much, holding on to the ball a little bit too long, and your defense couldn't get a stop. So I think, you know, I. But this is again, this is not a podcast about the Commanders or anybody no. in the NFC East. I just don't think that is a, like, if I, again, if I'm going to make a move at quarterback, I'm getting the best quarterback there, which is clearly Caleb Williams potentially. At least that's what we think. Or I'm getting like a Drake May, or I'm getting a. You know, I'm getting one of the top three guys. I'm not reaching for a guy that's all of a sudden just shooting up, you know, in 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 top five, top three conversations. But that's, again, mm-hmm. that's the commanders. If they do that, if the commanders reach at two and leave Drake May and Daniels there, then, again, if I'm the Vikings, I'm looking to move up to three, four, five and get one of those guys. Yeah, no matter what, whatever decision the commanders do make, it's ultimately going to affect the Minnesota Vikings because there, there's no way Washington's going to take anything other than a quarterback. But again, speaking on this J.J. McCarthy stuff just a little bit more, we even had uh, Jim Harbaugh going on this week basically appraising J.J. McCarthy for how excellent of a pro day he had, how ready he is as a pro, and everything like that. So even the hype among other NFL coaches is real with J.J. McCarthy. Now, granted, this is his old coach back at Michigan, so of course that's what Harbaugh is going to do. But honestly, artists, this is... 
This is just giving me fuel right now for just something I recklessly want to happen for the Minnesota Vikings. And I know, I know it's probably not going to happen because I'm guessing Harbaugh is going to want to start fresh with this guy anyway. But we've seen the kind of offseason that the L.A. Chargers have had. Basically, everybody on their offense left. Mike Williams is gone. Keenan Allen's gone. Uh, Austin Eckler's gone. They probably got some guys on the offensive line, like LaShawn Slater, that are pretty good. But still, I don't know who Justin Herbert is going to throw to. And here's my little fun little scenario. What if, what if the Vikings and the Chargers are able to strike a deal in trading Justin Herbert to Minnesota? And that would give Harbaugh on the Chargers the ability to draft J.J. McCarthy because Harbaugh loves J.J. McCarthy so much, as well as the rest of the league artists. Do you think there's any plausibility in this whatsoever, or have I just completely unsealed the jar of reckless speculation and now I can't put the lid back on? Anytime you get a big-name head coach in the building, like a Harbaugh or something like that, he's going to want his guy. He wants his guy. Now, whether that is J.J., or Herbert, I guess, will be decided very soon. Do I think they'll move off Herbert? No. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's smart. I, at the same time, have not liked their offseason at all. <laughs> uh, like you said, they got rid of pretty much every weapon from running back to receiver that they would have to help Herbert. And this team was not a perennial playoff team with those weapons. So now you take those weapons away. I'm not sure what you expect Herbert to do with what he has left. I can't name a receiver on their roster now. <laughs> so do I think it's possible? Anything is possible. I don't – I still don't – I will be shocked. Let's just put it like that. I will be shocked if they really moved off of Herbert. On the flip side, if you're the Vikings and you can strike that deal, mm. I think, you know, as crazy as this may sound, I might hesitate okay. because you just let go of Kirk Cousins because in large part his age – in large part, he's just coming off an Achilles tear. You know, you've kind of seen the ceiling with Kirk. But the money, mm-hmm. you're going to have to pay him a ton of money in order for him to stay. Same thing with Herbert. His contract is not small. Now, I'm not sure how the contract situation works. I don't know if they take the whole contract or if they if if the, if the Chargers still have to pay some of that. Con- like, I don't really know how that mm-hmm. works. I know that works for certain contracts. Russell Wilson being the latest example where, you know, the, the Steelers are paying like $1 million, but the Broncos are paying X amount of dollars. So I don't know if it's a similar situation. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, you know, if you do have a situation where you have to basically take on his entire contract, then you're kind of in the same situation you just was in right before you got rid of Kirk Cousins. Now, obviously, I think Herbert is better than Kirk Cousins. He's a lot younger. The ceiling is a lot higher. I mean, if you put that on the table, it will be hard for me to say no, <laughs> right? But I would has I would I would hesitate depending on how high you are on a JJ or on, on a Daniels, on a Drake May because we don't know these guys ceiling until you draft them and you get them in the building and you really see them throwing the ball to Addison and JJ mm-hmm. and you know Hawkinson and you see how they perform during reg- during the regular season. One of these guys could be Herbert for a lot cheaper, mm-hmm. right? Yep. And you have more money to spend. So it's a conversation. I think if you if you press me in the moment and said draft day, listen, the eleventh pick for Herbert, so they can move Oof. up or whatever, or you moved up and then they call, hey, you got the third pick, but we'll give you Herbert for that pick. I would probably, <laughs> yeah, I would probably yeah, yeah. take it. Yeah. I would probably, probably be like, look, this is this is Herbert, but. I wouldn't. I don't know if I would immediately do it. It will be a thought. It will be a conversation. It will be how much time are we left on the clock to make that decision? Because again, I I, I don't know if I want to take on that money right now when I could get a young guy who potentially could be Herbert. But you, you're going to struggle to pass on Herbert. <laughs> yeah. No. That was. That's what would make you a good GM. You don't do anything reactionary, artist. You're going to have to. Okay. I got the news. Let me think about it for a minute. Um. It, it would obviously depend on the draft pa- or the capital that you'd have to give up. Um, I'm I'm guessing Herbert would also command three first round picks. I'm guessing, especially because he's actually a proven talent. He is not potential like all these other quarterbacks. And I know like I know Herbert kind of gets a bad rep about not winning the playoffs yet or not just winning in general. But I think Brandon Staley was just not a good coach at all in that situation. He didn't seem like he was like handling emotionally. Well, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but it, it just didn't seem like it was a good coaching fit. 
from the beginning. And uh, he is, Staley was more of a defensive guy anyway, so Herbert would probably benefit greatly from being with an offensive coach like a Kevin O'Connell. I mean, if Herbert can look in the situation in Minnesota, J.J., Jordan Addison, you know, T.J. Hawkinson's got to heal up a little bit, might not be ready for week one, but then he's going to come back. Got two bookend tackles, Brian O'Neill and Christian Derrissaw. And, I mean, sure, your contract probably affects us a little bit, you're going to have potentially work with a team that has a ton of cap space going into 2025. This would be a very appealing spot for Justin Herbert, but maybe he's looking at the whole situation with Harbaugh. All right, fresh start. Staley's gone. We can do this thing. I'm living in Los Angeles. That's better than Minnesota. Let's be a little bit real about it. It's always nice and sunny. And we finally had some winter weather outside here in Minnesota. Finally, it's uh, beginning to look a lot like Christmas in March. Uh, But so I don't know. And I, I don't know if like, Maybe maybe Herbert even has like a no move clause. I don't know the actual like the nitty gritty of his actual contract, but man, oh, man, I, I admit, artist, that would probably excite me bringing him in more it than any qu- everybody. more than any quarterback that's out there in the draft, to be honest with you. Um, and now, granted, that might be coming from a Vikings fan who, you know, is used to trying to win every single season, who has been used to having a veteran quarterback as my quarterback for the last six years. You know, Kirk Cousins provide a lot of stability with us. And, you know, it can be easy to look at a situation like Herbert and see like, all right, he can kind of provide what Kirk provided a little bit with, <coughs> excuse me, a, little, a whole lot more upside as well. But I don't think the Chargers are hitting the reset button that dramatically when you when you got a franchise quarterback, unless things start like, you know, unless people start bumping heads in the locker room or something like that, you should definitely hold on to him. But still, it, it, a fun little reckless speculation that popped into my head, man, like, man, Harbaugh is just really talking up McCarthy and they have a top five pick. I'm sure they're getting phone calls a ton about trading into the top five as well. But I just... I'm expecting some even crazier things to happen just before the draft than so than more than anything that's already happened up to this point. So I wouldn't put past the Chargers and the Vikings doing something like that, but the reality of that, I would probably give that like a 1% chance of that even happening at the very least. Uh, one thing that's actually really encouraging, though, no matter what the quarterback situation is, Artis, is that we got reports that the Vikings are being very diligent about keeping J.J. in the loop throughout all this, despite his own contract negotiations. Kevin O'Connell, uh, per Kevin Seifert, uh, basically said that we're doing everything to keep J.J. Uh, keep in touch with him, let him know what we're doing, and that's really exciting. Um, I don't know if you saw this as well, but Mark Wilf, the president and co-owner of the Vikings, also did some media rounds because I think the NFL owners and uh, maybe general managers and even the coaches had some meetings over the past week down in sunny Florida. And Mark Wilf was literally grinning ear to ear talking about what the Vikings plan is at quarterback. Obviously, Mm. he didn't dive into details of exactly what was going on, but it was clear from this guy who's, you know, kind of comes off more as a reserved guy anyway. It doesn't seem like, to, you know, the Wilfs don't do a ton of media appearances as is. But this was one of the most giddy and excited I've ever seen Mark Wilf. Normally, he's a pretty straight shooter, but it definitely seemed like the fan part of him kind of overtook him a little bit. So, I mean, if J.J. McCarthy's the guy and the Vikings have a plan, no matter what artist, they have convinced ownership of what they are doing and they are going ahead with that. And that makes me happy because if maybe Wilf wasn't so uh, endorsive of, of exactly what was going on, maybe it would probably like wrinkle some feathers as we get close to the draft. But as of right now, everything seems good and kumbaya over at TCO performance center in Egan, which I think is a good thing because we need that synergy come draft time because it's going to get crazy. These waters are going to get choppy. I was going to say, let's just wait till we get to that point. Yeah. Let's wait till we get to that point. But I don't mm-hmm. blame him for being excited. This is an exciting time to be a Timberwolves fan. You know, you have mm-hmm. the potential to. You can look at it two ways. Everybody keeps bringing up Christian Ponder and all of the, mm-hmm. like, draft day whiffs and all the times where they didn't have a quarterback that they felt like was good enough to compete for, you know, a championship. Or you could look at it like, hey, let's look at the San Francisco 49ers. Let's look at the Philadelphia Eagles. Let's look at maybe even the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah. Teams that went out there, got them a quarterback, and they are they are in the hunt every single season now because they have one of those guys at the quarterback position. You know, even one of the guys you just mentioned, Herbert, you know, the Chargers, uh, maybe up to this moment, who knows what they do on a the draft day, who knows what's really going on with that, but I know they are happy with their quarterback, you know, mm-hmm. and yeah. they went out and drafted him as well. So you could look at it one of two ways. You know, you could be, you know, you could be optimistic about what you could get or you could be, you know, one of those fans that's like, oh, it's going to be another Christian Ponder situation. I, 
if I'm ownership, I'm I'm giddy as well because mm-hmm. you have an improved defense. Well, we'll we'll see because losing um, top edge rusher is 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 mm-hmm. tough. Yeah. That's, that's going that's going to hurt. But you know, you did make some additions on the defensive side of the ball. You know, obviously, you got to try to find a way to bring back Justin Jefferson. You brought in Aaron Jones. So you have a good team in place for a young quarterback to come and excel. All you got to do is hit the right one. So it's it's an exciting time. It's or, an exciting time. Or trade for Justin Herbert. One, of the, one, one Herbert. of the two things. By the way, I have not seen a single link uh, at all of, of mentioning Herbert's name to Minnesota at all. That's a, This is a completely organic thought. I think that's, <laughs> this I is just straight up me. That. I'm not like referencing anything. It's just like just me wishfully thinking. I've heard it before. I've heard it okay. being like speculated that he would okay. be on the move. After no, all no, the credible, moves, but... no credible reporting whatsoever about that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm just having fun here. I'm just having fun. <laughs> uh, you know what might not be so fun though, artists? If uh, Greg Joseph hits a game-winning field goal for the Green Bay Packers against the Minnesota Vikings at U.S. Bank Stadium this season, how about Greg the Leg going across the border to join the Cheeseheads of Green Bay? I guess this is only fair. I mean, we had Ryan Longwell all those years ago. He came from Green Bay to us, and now uh, I guess we're kind of returning the favor. But now this kind of opens up the room for a, a kicking competition for the Minnesota Vikings. John Parker Romo was signed from the XFL, but I wouldn't be surprised if they bring another guy in. So what do you think about Greg the Leg going on uh, to Wisconsin? And uh, what are we going to do at kicker? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great, question. <laughs> Great question. Great question. Might draft a guy. Um, we might draft a guy. Who knows? Um, you know, I, I, obviously kicker is an important position. I'd be lying if I sat here on Taxi Squad and said, <laughs> I know 10 kickers. You got to go try to. I, I don't know. Uh, I've I, got, I expect, you got 10, I'll give you 20. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. I, I expect them to, to, to fill that role. As far as, you know. Um, Greg going over to play for the Green, Bay, the Green Bay Packers. I mean, it happens. Vikings fans can't be upset about Vikings players going to play for Green Bay when you just got Aaron Jones, you got Brett Favre in the past. You got players that have come over from the Packers to this side. So if the money was there for him to go over there, by all means. He had great moments. He sure. had abysmal moments. So it's not as if you're, like, missing the greatest kicker ever. No. Nope. Let's just be honest. Nope. Still really good. Still really productive. Um but you could find another kicker in the draft. You can pick up another kicker in free agency. Not saying that position isn't isn't important because every Vikings fan knows you win and lose some <laughs> games with your kicker. We know this. Yes. But um, let's just hope that the quarterback that the Vikings draft or the quarterback that the Vikings make a trade for don't put you in too many, too many positions where you need a kicker to win your football game. They're winning these games with touchdowns. Let's just hope sure. for that. Obviously, that's, yeah. you know. We don't need the next guy to be Justin Tucker. We're we're okay. We just need to be serviceable. Greg Joseph was serviceable after the debauchery with Dan Bailey. Man, that just, after that Tampa Bay Buccaneers game where he missed like three field goals, it was just an absolute mess. But that was kind of a symptom of being a kicker under Mike Zimmer, because if Mike Zimmer had his way, he'd probably outlaw kicking and punting entirely in (laughs) professional football. He doesn't really, and he doesn't like paying uh, quarterbacks too much money either, and he makes that very, very clear. Um, Greg provided a lot of stability over the last couple years. We really haven't talked about kicking issues too much involving the Minnesota Vikings the last couple years, and I appreciate that because that is usually a topic of conversation that happens a lot in this town. The problem with Greg, though, was those extra points. He missed yeah. a lot of extra points, and that's frustrating. I know the extra points move back a little bit. They're more like actual field goals now, but still, it's just when you are a kicker in an enclosed environment, which Greg Joseph was playing at U.S. Bank Stadium, you just expect that number to be a little bit higher. But still, he had some great moments, set an NFL record, I believe. For it was an NFL record or Vikings record? I can't remember exactly what it was. But Greg the leg was an NFL record. I okay, so. okay. Um, but yeah, he provided a decent amount of stability, um, and that was just fine. But did he really elevate the special teams game in a way that the Vikings, where Vikings fans are really going to miss him so much? I'm not necessarily sure about that. Does it hurt that he goes to the Packers? Well, duh, of course it does. But still, um, they they need to figure out what they were going to do in Green Bay because Daniel Carlson's brother was an absolute mess for them. And uh, Greg should be pretty decent kicking in Lambeau. Now, maybe it will be a transition for him to kick out at the frozen tundra, but we'll just have to see, and we'll obviously have to see what the Vikings do. I'm guessing we'll have a pretty hefty kicking competition going into training camp, and we will find out who our kicker will be through that process. And maybe a guy will get cut. You never know um, when that time comes for teams to do that around uh, training camp and stuff, so maybe there will be another guy out there 
for the Minnesota Vikings. Let's get on to the Minnesota Timberwolves, though, Artis. Mm-hmm. Again, they're playing right now as we speak. They got a 40-32 to 32 lead over the Pistons. That's, that, that score's got to get bigger, Artis. These Pistons are terrible. We need to blow these guys out. But I know the They'll Pistons kept us close, I think, the last time we played them, if I'm not mistaken, too. But uh, I got to admit, uh, Artis, I am swept up in Nazamania. Yes. Nazamania, Nas Reed, my goodness. I mean, did you see all the fans waving the towels at the game against uh, the Cavaliers the other night? That was so much fun, and he had a great game as well. Um, had some really emphatic uh, three-point shots and had a big dunk, I believe, with just about like two and a half minutes to go. I believe a big shot. I can't remember if it was dunk or not. But then he kept it going also against the Warriors, too. Six of eight from three-point land. He made his first five threes as well, got the crowd going. It's been another fantastic week of Nas Reed for the Minnesota Timberwolves artists. And again, considering we're still missing Carl Anthony Towns, this just keeps getting encouraging, more encouraging and more encouraging. And also it would appear that Rudy is still maybe dealing with uh, that rib issue. So just for Nas to, he's playing, (laughs) but for Nas to just kind of take over the way he's been taken over, it's just awesome to see. Yeah. Nas has really taken the bull by the horns um, in, in, the the space of not having Car Anthony Towns. He's knowing exactly what you would hope he would do. He is literally like the second guy that you're going to offensively for buckets. He's flourishing. And, you know, I said this on Four Wolves Takes. Check it out if you haven't already. Got to plug you in right there. Right? Plug it in, um, plug it in. I think he has top five forward potential. Mm. Top five. Um, I'm not saying this year. I'm not saying next year. I'm not saying, you know. But when you think about the fact that a guy like LeBron, a guy like Kevin Durant, um, guys like Giannis, um, Sabonis, these guys are, you know, some of these guys are getting a little older and up there in age and a new wave, a new generation is is getting ready to to kind of take over the position. I can see him being one of those guys mm-hmm. if given a larger role within the offense, which we kind of see now um, over the next couple of years, I can see him being one of the top five guys at the at the position, whether you go small forward or power forward, wherever you want to put him. I think he's more of a small forward than he is a power forward or a center. He's dang sure not a center. Let's just let's be clear. He's not. He, a center. He's he tall play, enough to be, not, but he doesn't have to enough, be. But he's tall enough, but he's you know naturally you could tell he's not really a center. Yeah. Um. So he's playing great basketball, man. Honestly, he's. He, I kind of saw, you know, in in like my research and my studies up on him before the Car Anthony Towns injury kicked in, that anytime he's playing over thirty minutes, he's getting you like twenty seven. He's yeah. like he's, he's putting up solid numbers. You know, this is now it's not as often he's getting a twenty seven, but he's still getting thirty here, twenty five, twenty, you know, twenty and twelve. You know, so Nas is a problem. He's a he's a matchup nightmare for a lot of different teams because of the skill set. He could do so many things at one time on the floor. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you you do miss Carl Anthony Towns from time to time for sure, sometimes even defensively. Um, but he's shooting the ball, shooting like 42% from three-point line. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're you're not missing a huge offensive offensive punch, which is crazy to say yes. because Cat is your second-best player, especially offensively. But you're not missing a huge – you're not missing – much of anything offensively because Nas is filling in and, and playing big. So, yeah, I love what I'm seeing from him. I was going to bring this up this week, Artis. I mean, it kind of feels like we're not missing Carl Anthony Towns at all right now. You're missing him a tick defensively. A, a tick t- defensively. Which, again, is crazy to say because normally Carl Anthony Towns has not been had a reputation of being a strong defender, but that's just how good the Timberwolves have been this season. Um, the thing that's been really encouraging to me and it kind of that parlays into like, yeah, maybe the Wolves aren't missing Carl Anthony Towns as much. These last two games against the Cavs and the Warriors, they shot 50% from three. Mm-hmm. And this has not been the most efficient three-point shooting team throughout the entire season. Well, you were able to do that with arguably, without your arguably best three-point shooter in Carl Anthony Towns. And so I'm seeing a little bit of stability with a three-point shooting, a shooting. I'm also seeing a little bit more volume, too, because that was another issue with the Wolves is that they weren't shooting a ton of three-pointers as well. This is obviously led by Nas Reed, and that's really, really exciting. But, I mean, if we're able to you know, out, you know, uh, add more efficiency to our three point shooting than we have in pre pre like earlier this season without Carl Anthony, Anthony Towns. That's absolutely awesome. Especially because Anthony Edwards didn't have the most efficient week either. He, he was, he was just okay. He didn't do anything crazy. You know, granted he's coming off a couple of weeks where he's hitting his head on the rim, right. blocking shots right. and, you know, giving people concussions on dunks. So maybe it's just like, okay, that's just a natural for the hype to come down a little bit with Anthony Edwards. But, you know, those the Warriors are a pesky team. They, they admittedly, they looked old 
They, they looked old. They you you don't want to say that with Curry, but Chris Curry's still going back and down the court, and that's fine and everything. But it's just like, man, I know I don't, I won't ever discount the Warriors come playoff time. I will. But it's just, <laughs> he will. Be sure, I he will. will. <laughs> he will. But it's just like, man, it's they just that a... is the oldest I've ever seen them, and it's just so weird. It was so weird, kind of watching the Wolves come back on them too, because normally we've seen so many Golden State Warriors just lock down those games and not give them up. And I know it's just it's just not the same team, but it's just it's just so strange to watch. But obviously, it's the Wolves' benefit. That's the first time they've swept the season series with the Warriors since the late '90s. So that's awesome. Even though there's some pretty bad Warriors teams before Stephen Clay and Draymond showed up, I'm also glad that Rudy and Draymond kept things civil. The other night, because based off what's happened between those two, especially earlier this season, it's just and, and I think Draymond got ejected tonight. So maybe Draymond just he pent up some stuff. The and then he, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, did, you know, got mean with the magic or something tonight and, you know, just let out all that frustration. But I'm, I'm glad things everybody kept things a little bit civilized and we can focus just on, you know, the actual basketball between the Minnesota Timberwolves and uh, the Golden State Warriors. I am keeping an eye on, on uh, it's not Draymond, sorry, Rudy Gobert. I noticed him grabbing his rib a little bit um, against the Warriors. I haven't seen anything really up uh, against the Pistons and him dealing with any issues this week. Um, but again, I'm just sensitive to injury issues with the whole Carl Anthony Towns thing, and I hope Rudy's doing okay. Otherwise, Jane McDaniels had another good week, a pretty good efficient three-point shooting week. Jordan McLaughlin continues to just be the little ener- energizer bunny off of this bench. And Monty Morris also is starting to, I think, really get a feel for just being a key piece in this rotation now. I think things started a little bit slowly for him after the trade deadline, and he had a pretty good week as well. And um, we got the matchup with the Nuggets again this yeah. upcoming week, Artis. Big time and, game. And Big. admittedly, just the way the Nuggets are playing, my hopefulness that we can still get the number one seed is waning with each passing day. We're a game and a half back of them that we can still catch them, especially with games we got to play against them. But the Nuggets are playing so well right now. I'm just worried we're not going to catch them. However, however, I'm going to reserve the right to change that opinion based off what happens against the Nuggets this next week. Because if we go into Denver and get an emphatic win, I'm right back in it, right back saying, hey, let's go up there against the Thunder. Let's go up against the Nuggets. Let's go get this one seed. I don't think we have to worry about the Clippers anymore. The Clippers are not playing great basketball as of right now. But, um, yeah, as of right now, maybe I'm hesitant to really just like, ah, let's keep going for the one seed. I don't know if the Wolves can do that as of right now because Denver's playing great. But that opinion may change if we beat Denver. So. Yeah, I ain't trying to hear that. Jason, go for the one seed. I know. No, you, I, you know I seed. want them to. I'm listen, just, I'm just the being way realistic. that Listen, one, one and a half games back is very realistic to catch up to. Um, the yeah. Nuggets are a really good team. We're not going to deny that. They are the defending champs for a reason. But we just played these guys and lost by three points without Nas and Rudy on the floor. Now, granted, we've had talks off the air about how different they play if they got if those guys are in the lineup, and maybe it's a different game. It is a complete different game for both teams at that point. But that was an important game, mm-hmm. and those guys really struggled to close that game out. And the Wolves could have easily won that game. And so, you know, nothing's off the table with the Wolves. You know, if I'm the Wolves, I'm still going all in on trying to get that that one or even that two seed in the Western Conference because I think your best matchups fall in that area, whether it be you know. The, the the eighth or the seventh seed, depending on who that is, especially if you can see Golden State, um, because Golden State has a size issue. Like that's just yeah. that's the biggest problem with them. They have a size issue. Just in this previous game where they played, you know, the the uh, the um, Timberwolves, they literally basically needed two guys to deal with Rudy Gobert rolling to the <laughs> basket. Like they they like all eyes was on Rudy Gobert rolling to the basket, which left so many backdoor cuts open, which left so many three point shots open. Which explains in that game why they shot 53%. Because guys were getting wide open looks because they were so focused on slowing down Rudy Gobert. So they have a serious size issue. I feel like they needed their get back against the Cavs. Because remember the way that game ended last time they played with Rudy yeah. doing the money yep. sign and all that. Yeah. So, um, yep. but I'm, listen, I'm all in on the one seed. Um, I'm all in on, you know, them potentially playing the Warriors or maybe even the Lakers in the first round of the playoffs, potentially if the Lakers make it. Um, mm. the Mavs are an interesting matchup. The Phoenix is also an interesting matchup. But if if I'm no if I am if I am not a fan and I am a player on the Timberwolves or a coach for the Timberwolves, I am locked in on trying to get to that one seed. You play Denver two more at least I think two more times. 
um, just regular season, you have a chance to beat these guys. And if you tie with them and have the same record as those guys, I think you still have the division mm -hmm. um, tiebreaker over these guys. So you would be in front of them in the standings. It's right there. Why not, you know, go for it and give yourself the best opportunity to, you know, potentially compete for a championship this year. I, I'm all for it. I'm all for it, too. I, I know I'm hesitant in thinking that will actually happen. But if if you're all in like the Wolves should be this season, that that is obviously the main goal. That is the main priority. That is the What's main What's not focus. helping is them struggling with these Pistons still, Jason. Yeah, not, tight sorry 45. To going into halftime. 30 seconds, is yeah. A tight game. Just um, pick it up, guys. Pick it up. Maybe the Pistons have just found inspiration that they haven't had all season before. I don't really know what's gotten into them. Um, they should try to lose as much as possible so they can draft. By the way, I was looking at an NBA mock draft because we got March Madness going on, so there's yes. a lot of mock drafts flying out. Artists, I don't know. A s I, I was looking through the top ten. I didn't know a single one of the guys. Do you a know, single Edie, one was of the Edie, was, was Edie in the oh, top ten? No, not even close. Oh no. dang! Well, I don't yeah, think I, I don't think he'll get drafted high because he, the tall, lumbery centers don't really he cold though. People, I, don't I know, people I know, but like Luke, man, look but he at got some game. perfect example is Luca Garza, an awesome college basketball player, fantastic for Iowa, but he was drafted in the second round, and now he is a bench warmer for the Timberwolves, who <laughs> you know gets gets some minutes every now and then. He's kind of a fan favorite too. We like Luca Garza around here, and he actually said on public record too, saying, "Hey." Uh, normally, I'm not used to cheering for Gopher fans, you know, because I'm from Iowa. But as long as you root for the Timberwolves, that's a okay with me. So we <laughs> right. like uh, Luca Garza around here. But uh, yeah, this isn't uh, not looking great right now for the Pistons uh, against the, the Pistons. Though. But they'll they'll figure out a whole they'll half of basketball to figure things out. And you know, I just don't expect the Pistons to really just uh, you know stay in this fight too much. But we'll see what goes on with the Wolves again. That big big matchup. With the Nuggets, uh, it's it, we're going to be locked in with it. It's going to be such a fun game. I expect a really close game. And, I, and again, I expect the Nuggets to just play a little bit differently than they did last time. I expect Jokic to have more than two assists yeah. in that ball game and not shoot 22 times as well. I'm expecting we're going to see kind of the more traditional Denver Nuggets that we've seen as opposed to maybe, you know, where Jokic was the primary ball handler and scorer like we did a couple weeks ago uh, against the Timberwolves. So, yeah, we'll just have to see what happens. Um Couple just uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? housekeeping items I want to get to just involving with the Minnesota Wild really quick. I kind of wish AJ was on the show uh, today just because last week the Wild were only three points back of a wild card spot and they currently find themselves nine. Mm. So we've had a pretty dramatic swing, even though they only played one game. And that was a devastating overtime loss of the St. Louis Blues. You had a lead going into the third period artists and they just. They, they just blew it. It was really unfortunate. Sure, Brock Favor tied the game to get overtime, and that was exciting. But still, you, you, St. Louis is behind you at this point in the standings. You, you can't lose to them. And now we're at the point where we've got about 10, 11 games to go. You, you can't lose to anybody. You literally can't lose to anybody. you got two games against Vegas, too. That's the team that you're chasing the most at this point. They're, they're getting hot, too. They, they're finally, their trade acquisitions are starting to finally gel for Vegas. The Tomas Hurdles and other guys, too, where they're finally actually starting to play good hockey. Nashville's playing awesome as well. They haven't slowed down. And this is kind of one why I wanted AJ here today because I was, I'm was i almost ready to say uh, RIP to the 2023-2024 Minnesota Wild season. I'm, I'm almost at that point. That's probably why he didn't want to come today. That's probably why he didn't want to come. He's too sad. He wanted to take a break. He's just like, I can't talk about my favorite hockey team right now. But let's look Let's look at the bright side here, artists, for just a little bit. Because now, now that we kind of pretty much know, even though, yes, we're not officially eliminated, now we can actually focus on the future because the Wild really haven't led us at this point because they've been so close in the points pretty much up to this point. Now we get to focus on some fun things, even though the season's not ending the way we want to. We can focus on the Calder Trophy. We can focus on the seasons that Marco Rossi and Brock Faber are having, and we can hopefully prop them up a little bit and get their stats up where they can actually get that trophy. Uh, now I know that Connor Bedard's probably going to get that, and even though he might not deserve it because he hasn't played as much this season as some of the other rookies in the NHL, it's still inevitability. I mean, he's just a generational talent, and what are you going to do about that? But that doesn't mean we cannot try. That doesn't mean we cannot try. And we got a perfect slate now where we can experiment, call up some top prospects, get Jesper Wallstad up here, so on and so forth. It's just now, now we actually know. Now we actually know with the Minnesota Wild, after all this time, artists, after all the teases that this team has been doing to us all season long, we finally know, all right, 
they're not going to make the playoffs. And it's good to know, man. I think I think you, I think we all uh, we had a hint that it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> I know it was just hard. to I know. grasp. Maybe they have shins. Maybe they, they, I know it's over. I know, and that's hockey. And it's man. okay for it to be over. It's and, okay. Let's move on to the future. Now, if they win the like the if they win their last like ten or eleven in a row, they okay, won't. They, they, they won't. They absolutely won't. But then they probably would be back in the playoffs, and then we get to have fun conversations about the Wild again. But as of right now. Um, the the lid on the casket is this close to closing, artist. It, it is that close. Taxi Squad fans, we, it's over. We haven't put the <laughs> coffin in the ground quite yet, but we are at the funeral for the Minnesota Wild. And uh, last thing, Mark Usnadinov, looking like he's uh, figuring things out well, looking like he's gelling well. He's a face-off machine, which is absolutely fantastic. That's what the Wild need to win those face-offs. That's been the highlight of his game, too. Um, I don't know if he scored a goal yet. I don't believe he has. He's definitely tally to points. I know that for sure, but he's kind of like been the, the top prospect that the Wild have kind of been looking at this season, and they got him over from Russia, and now he's here, and now he gets some good playing time along with all the other prospects for the Wild. So enjoy the development time. That That's kind of what it's for, and let's again push for the rookies that we have, the Brock Favors, the Marco Rossi's, to actually get up in the Calder standings, again, even if they might not ultimately win the trophy. So maybe AJ will be back next week and we'll talk a little bit more puck, and we'll see what he thinks about my my theory that the Wild might actually be dead in the water finally here uh, this hockey season. And lastly, before we wrap up Taxi Squad, as you notice, I'm wearing my favorite Star Wars Minnesota Twins shirt. I got my Twins hat on. It's opening day. It's upon us. It's tomorrow. Baseball finally returns it's spring, even though it's felt like spring hours pretty much the entire winter here in Minnesota. I mean, wow. we had 60-degree uh, days in you know, early February. It was just absolutely nuts. But here we are. We're finally here. And I really wish I could be more optimistic about my Minnesota Twins. I really could. Now, granted, granted, they're going to probably win the division because the rest of the division stinks. But when you go through an offseason, when you slash payroll this much and you do very little to actually add to the talent of the roster. It's hard for me to sit here before any of you and actually say, all right, I expect the Minnesota twins to have an even better season than they did last year. Sure. We can bank on the developments of Royce Lewis, Matt Walner, some other guys as well. But when you have a front office and more importantly, an ownership who just refuses, refute, literally refuses to actually spend money to make your team better. It's just I don't know what I don't know what you want me to do as a fan. I don't know how you can expect me to root for you. How expect you expect me to fully invest in you? It's just you took this magical little thing that was the 2023 Minnesota Twins. They finally won a playoff game, hardest, and they won a playoff series too. It was great. I kind of got screwed over. I didn't get to go to the game because eh, I won't get into that. Uh, but I actually oh, got a, yeah, the, the ticket situation, the ticket situation. Uh, but actually, funny thing about that, I got an email from that ticket provider this past week refunding my money. Oh, that's Finally, nice. after Good. six months, it was only 10 bucks. So I was really surprised to get the email. And I was just like, ah, forget about 10 bucks. I'll live. It'll be fine. But then I got the email. I was like, oh, here's your money back. I went, oh, thank you. They also gave me like a $20 voucher, too. So I'm going to oh, have wow. to use that up at some point. I just, Better late than ever, I guess. But anyway, lastly, really quick with the Minnesota Twins because we got to wrap up Taxi Squad. Um, it's just it's just so weird. This this team is primed to go to the playoffs again, and yet it's just it doesn't feel like there's a lot of momentum going into the season. But uh, they're plus 1,900 to win the World Series. That's ninth. Uh, they're projected for 87 and a half wins. Um, and I think I'm going to put their record this season to win the AL Central. I think I'll give them an 89 and 73 record i didn't want to give them exactly 90 wins artists because they don't deserve for me to give them 90 wins based off the offseason that they had but this should still be an offensively competent team this should should still be a very good pitching staff even if we have questions about the starting rotation is it deep enough especially now that anthony desclafani is probably not going to pitch all season for us the guy that we got in the trade for jorge polanco that thrust louis varlin probably into that number five spot but of course we're replacing sunny gray and uh, also the bullpen. I mean, Yohan Duran probably going to start the season on the IL. That is, that's not good. That's not good. He's our best, arguably our best pitcher in general, and hopefully he's going to be able to come back. So not only do we have, you know, depth issues, the rotation, we also have in the bullpen, and those are supposed to be arguably our two biggest strengths of this team. But baseball is back. It makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. It makes me feel like there's just sunshine out and that the flowers are sprouting, and it just makes me feel good. It makes me feel nice and warm after a long Minnesota winter, even if this was the least Minnesota winter of all Minnesota 
Winters. Anyway, that's going to wrap up Taxi Squad, I think, for the week. Again, just the Vikings keep giving us gold, man. I'm sorry. This is just so great being able to talk about draft record speculation in in so long. Every single week, there's just more content than, than we really know what to do with, and we're happy to talk with you guys uh, here on Taxi Squad about it. Obviously, Wolves are still going on. We're locked in with the playoffs. Wild, you know, we won't talk much about the Wild probably much anymore, but the Twins are just ramping up, and we'll pro- talk plenty of baseball throughout the season. Artists, any final thoughts before we wrap up the show for the week? That is it for me. Just beat the Pistons tonight, Just man. beat this the Pistons, man. Close. But can yeah, I, that's, can, that's it. That's all I got. Can I get one last opinion from you about something? Sure thing. What do you think about the kickoff changes in the NFL, and also what do you think about the hip tackle rule that's banned really quick? I mean, the kickoff – rule change kind of is what it is like i mean it was already like 95 percent touchbacks anyway nowadays so i mean it's a little awkward looking i don't like the fact that it takes away the surprise onside kick i think that's an element of the game that i think coaches maybe not use all the time but it's still a nice element to have to throw a team off with a surprise onside kick um the hip tackle thing is tough like i don't know how you tackle in the nfl at this point um, you, I mean, they have made the game, you know, so it's so, so offensive so favor. It yeah. favors offenses like, more so, than ever. So they have made the, and I understand that makes for an exciting product. We get that. But as a defender, thank God I, I'm not tasked with trying to tackle someone because at this point I don't know. You can't tackle too high. If you go too low, you're dirty. If you tackle them and kind of use your body to bring them down, which a lot of lighter defenders do with bigger guys like a a Mark Andrews or a Derrick Henry or just guys that are, you know, bigger players, you know, that's illegal as well. It's like, you know, and then you got all the rules on how, how you can hit a quarterback and you can't land on them a certain way. I think they are doing some type of, like, review with that as well now where they're going back I, and reviewing, I, I like, track of all roughing the now. passers now. I don't know. Oh, I hope um, they don't do that because that, uh, yeah, that would just make things longer and drawn out. I mean, I'm and... kind, I'm not really opposed to that because it'd be some weird roughing the passer calls that I wish they would pull back yeah. on that maybe this would help, but then there's sometimes, there are times where it could hurt. So. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm okay with the with the kicking with the the kickoff one, even though I do feel like it takes away the surprise onside kick. Not yeah. too happy with that, but overall, that's okay. The the drop hip tackle thing is how do you, you they need to come out with a manual or a a script or some type of video to show players how they're supposed to tackle? Because I got news for you, like good luck bringing down some of the best offensively. Gifted how, players how else in the are you going to bring in, bring down like a tight end like Travis Kelsey or, or a big guy like, like that? You know what I mean? Guys like Debo, like yeah. guys who just break every tackle. Like if you're an undersized safety or an undersized defensive tackle, an undersized linebacker, you're going to have a hard time. Yeah. You, just, you, you might have a hard time. So I mean, we'll see. Um, we'll see how this pans out. I know this is all about player safety and all of that, but yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, I don't know, I, I don't know either. It just. It's, it's such a bang-bang play, most of those tackles, too. So it's going to put the refs in weird positions as well to make those calls. I mean, I'm hoping this is something that's lightly officiated, like some calls are in the NFL, you know, like you know, like holding on offensive lines. You know what I mean? There's, there's holding on literally every play on the offensive line. It just has to be super-duper egregious for uh, a referee to actually call it. I'm hoping that's the case here because... I, I just and, and I know you're trying to take away the injuries, and I know like the the point of this tackle was that like the defender is like falling on the offensive player's legs, and that's where all the problems are. But it's just, guys, it's football. It's yeah, a violent it's, it's sport. A violent sport. I mean, we can't. I think, I think we take lose away. sight of that. I think we we lose yeah. sight of that way too often. And and you know what? Maybe like fantasy football has a lot to do with that. I mean, I I can definitely see like that kind of stuff, like jading fans and stuff. It shouldn't. But like, yeah, you got you got offensive linemen who can basically, you know, cut down defensive linemen at the knees and stuff like that. And that kind of stuff doesn't get called sometimes. And maybe chop blocks get called every now and then. But still, it's just more and more every single year rules are passed that make it so much easier for offenses than defenses. And look, I can't deny the NFL is a money making machine. Got to do what you got to do. But it's just, it's weird. But I am excited to see that potential of kickoffs being an actual exciting play again. Because it's been honestly really annoying to watch all these kickoffs at noon, yeah. and just be so anticlimactic because they just get kicked out of the end zone and everything. Um, so I, I'm I'm glad to see it back. I saw a couple times the XFL doing it. It looks interesting. It looks unique. I thought it was really funny though. Like 
not even like an hour after the rule was passed, the Steelers signed Cordero Patterson. And I just right, thought as a former right, Viking fan, I'm like, yeah, oh, that's yeah. pretty funny, but also makes sense. They want a kick return specialist now at this point too. So yeah, we'll see how those rules potentially affect Vikings games and other NFL games in the future. But otherwise, that's going to wrap up things for Taxi Squad here this week, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Stormer. That is Artist Woods. Thank you so much again for joining us for all the reckless speculation about the Vikings, Timberwolves, Wild, and Twins. And we will catch you guys on the next time. Take care. Bye-bye.